I will hand over right now to you, Paolo. Uh, so please feel free to, to, to start presenting and, and maybe say some words about yourself. Uh, thank you for being here once again. Thank you for having me here. So my name is uh, Paolo. I've been uh, in the steelmaking business uh, since uh, 1998. I am the sales director for uh, Tenova Electrical Furnaces and Ladle Furnaces. And uh, uh, I cooperate strongly with my colleagues at Tenova HYL since uh, in the decarbonization route, uh, uh, electrical furnaces uh, and uh, uh, direct reduction models go hand in hand. And today I will be presenting to you the experience done uh, by our uh, colleagues uh, of uh, uh, Tenova HYL about uh, the usage of uh, uh, hydrogen in the direct reduction and the consequences on safety. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, it's perfect, Paolo. Perfetto. So, okay, disclaimer. Tenova is uh, an engineering company that constitutes a part uh, of the international uh, Tekint group uh, whose uh, main business uh, is uh, producing uh, steel under the brands uh, of Tenaris and Ternium. Tenaris uh, is the largest worldwide producer of uh, uh, seamless uh, uh, tubes for uh, oil drilling for instance, in similar application, where Asternium produces 14 million ton per year of uh, flat products. Tenova is a technological company developing solution for the industrial world, uh, from uh, the basically concentrated on the industry of steel making and uh, metal making, but also material handling. Rather than being a, a large construction company, we uh, based our we base our uh, mid-term and long-term sustainability on being always able to provide a cutting-edge solution to address the issues of the future. The most prominent issue now for the steelmaking industry is, of course, the decarbonization of the steelmaking industry, since the steelmaking contributes for about eight and nine percent of the total. Uh, uh, greenhouse gases emissions from the industrial sector worldwide. So something needs to be done uh, in this sector. And uh, our main answer to the decarbonization uh, is uh, the direct reduction. You know uh, that uh, the uh, direct reduction is a way to uh, replace and, uh, uh, the blast furnace uh, iron ore reduction. In the blast furnaces, the iron ore are reduced from iron oxide to metallic iron by means of a reaction that's based on carbon. The coal charged, the coking coal, the coke coal charged into the furnace together with the burden is transformed, is oxidized, partially burnt and transformed in carbon monoxide. And inside the shaft of the blast furnace, the carbon monoxide operates the reduction of the iron ore into metallic iron, at the same time melting the gang into slag. The result of this process is a liquid hot metal with high percentages of carbon, uh, three and a half percent and upwards uh, and uh, the production uh, the result of the production are part uh, of uh, a metallic iron and of metal of course uh, and slag uh, is carbon dioxide when we compare this process uh, with the direct reduction module as operated with uh, uh, in the most common way operating with natural gas well the natural gas uh, the methane contains uh, one eighth of of uh, carbon and four atoms of uh, uh, hydrogen. So uh, through the partial oxidization of the methane inside the module, uh, it is obtained uh, one molecule of uh, carbon monoxide and uh, one molecule and two molecules of uh, uh, hydrogen that in turn operate uh, the reduction of the uh, iron ore inside the shaft. Differently from uh, the 
blast furnace process in the direct reduction shaft the metal and the material do not reach the melting point the material are discharged at 700 degrees uh, so they retain the form of pellets and then they can be charged either hot into a downstream reactor uh, namely an electrical furnace or uh, a, a submerged furnace of sort uh, and then molten and transformed into steel so in the normal way of operating of the most possibly normal uh, uh, direct reduction plant there is a, a lot of hydrogen already uh, in the process if one operates the module by green hydrogen only doesn't change much except there is no longer carbon monoxide in the reduction gas mix you just have hydrogen in such case by having only the hydrogen operating the reaction of reducing the iron oxide into metallic iron the only byproduct is steam so the scheme of the HYL energy iron modules is natively able to operate with 100% hydrogen, meaning the scheme of the zero reformer module, that's our module, the uh, reaction of transforming, of reforming the methane into carbon monoxide and hydrogen happens entirely inside the module using the very same pellets of uh, iron that have been fed uh, into the module as catalyst for this reaction. So the module inside the module is produced at the reduction gas. Uh, we don't need therefore uh, any external reformer and uh, the energy iron technology natively includes uh, a scrubber for removing the carbon dioxide and uh, the traces of hydrogen sulfide from the from the cycle then the gas that has been uh, uh, cleaned by steam so the steam is condensed then the carbon dioxide the co2 and then hydrogen sulfide are stripped away uh, by uh, via amines and then uh, the cleaned gas is recirculated inside the module reheated in the process gas heater and then back in the module uh, added with uh, fresh gas either uh, hydrogen or natural gas or cocoa and gas or any similar gas suitable for the uh, uh, DRI operation. The beauty of it is that uh, the module that one can buy today to operate with 100% natural gas or cocoa and gas or whatever such other gas can be used tomorrow with 100% hydrogen or any mixes thereof. Because let's not forget that for the steel production process, some carbon needs to be there. So uh, uh, even though 100% hydrogen looks very nice from the point of view of the environment, uh, one will always need to put some carbon somewhere in the process. We believe that the best way to put carbon in the DRI process is to put it inside the reactor by mixing some small percentages of natural gas or cocoa and gas to the gaseous mix and getting pellets with the desired, uh, uh, desired uh, carbon percentage. Nevertheless, the first module in the world operating with 100% percent uh, hydrogen is based on the, uh, the HYL technology is the module in Sweden I will be taking uh, I will be talking about uh, uh, hybrid uh, later on during this small presentation uh, Midrex that is our competitor technology they developed uh, a scheme also for operating with 100 percent hydrogen that is very similar to ours the main difference uh, are in the pressure at which the module operate in the midrex scheme the module operates basically at ambient pressure in uh, HYL module we operate at six bar more or less uh, and the operating temperature but basically you can recognize that the scheme is very similar first of all hydrogen for us is uh, a normal thing because uh, even if you operate with 100% uh, natural gas uh, 
you still have a lot of hydrogen in the module, 70 percent of hydrogen in the module if you operate uh, with uh, uh, natural gas, because actually hydrogen is the natural product of breaking the molecular of uh, methane. So 70% for us uh, with our scheme going from 70% to 100% didn't need any modification. Actually, we have been doing uh, tests with a high hydrogen concentration in the module since the 90s. And we measured the kinetics of the reaction of uh, iron reduction by using uh, various concentration of hydrogen. So, for instance, uh, uh, we know that the reduction by hydrogen is highly endothermic. So it's favored by having high temperature in the module. But we also know that the kinetics of reaction, uh, are mostly due to the higher diffusivity, of the hydrogen atoms into the pellets proceed four times faster than the reduction by carbon monoxide. So actually a module uh, designed to work with methane, when you feed it with higher percentage of hydrogen or entirely hydrogen, it becomes more productive uh, due to the uh, quicker reaction of reduction inside the module. In the 90s already, we were tinkering with pure hydrogen into the module. We made tests, uh, test campaign, not just one run. We made, need a, we made test campaign with up to 90% uh, pure hydrogen uh, since the 90s. And so we matured our own experience that led to the design of the hybrid module uh, for one. So we had the opportunity already to optimize the process parameter and to measure the effects of the DRI pellets, of the green DRI pellet into the process. Actually, the design of our models was optimized since the 90s in terms of uh, uh, geometry, working pressure, working temperature, already to fit the hydrogen needs. So this was an unintend unintended byproduct. It's a serendipity that uh, now that everybody is talking about hydrogen, we fell already from the 90s on a technology that was already suitable to operate with it. And of course, uh, the impact of the replacement of the natural gas with hydrogen is dramatic. Uh, one can reduce the emissions already by five times operating with 70% hydrogen in the feed. And of course, the CO2 goes down to zero when operating with 100% natural gas. The division in our graphs between selective and non-selective is the CO2 that is caught by the scrubber by the amine scrubber in the cycle, and the CO2 that is caused by the process gas heater if the process gas heater is fired by natural gas. So even this quota, this blue quota, can be dramatically reduced or brought down to zero simply by eliminating the use of fossil fuels for reheating the gas. There are experiences now ongoing with electric rating, for instance, that would zero entirely the CO2 emission uh, independently from the content of carbon inside the module. Let's talk now, let's get back to the core then of the presentation, hydrogen and safety. A lot of people is scared about use of nitrogen in many applications. Uh, hydrogen is an odorless gas. So it is impossible to detect it immediately. That uh, adds some uh, difficulty in uh, hydrogen safety. But uh, on the other hand, uh, is uh, non-toxical. So it has no direct effect uh, on, the, on the health of uh, the person who could breathe it. And uh, the buoyancy of the hydrogen is way higher than the buoyancy of natural gas. This means that uh, in case of a leakage, uh, the hydrogen disperses way faster than natural gas does. Uh, on the other hand, uh, hydrogen is known uh, under some conditions 
to cause uh, embrittlement uh, in the vessels and tubes uh, uh, that are used to contain it because the hydrogen under certain conditions tends to diffuse into the metallic matrix, uh, changing the mechanical properties and causing uh, uh, stress corrosion. We will talk about this because this is the main topic of the, the main topic of the risks uh, connected with uh, hydrogen. Of course, beyond uh, the all the normal stuff, uh, hydrogen is flammable, same as uh, uh, natural gas is. So there should be no open flames uh, next to uh, places where uh, hydrogen leakages are possible. You need to guarantee ventilation. You need to guarantee uh, a suitable way to detect uh, leaks uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, with uh, a big, big, big highlight on the uh, uh, training of the personnel that is supposed to be operating with such equipment. When you go and uh, analyze uh, the standards uh, under which one needs to design uh, a system intended to operate with hydrogen, when you go down to the standards, uh, uh, there is uh, nothing special meaning that uh, the same standards uh, uh, apply uh, with uh, some uh, very few ex exception is ASME B31, that is the code for pressure piping and vessels. Uh, the same goes for the European Union. Uh, the, only, the only indications are on thicknesses, maximum speed, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, nothing special there. Uh, there are on the other hand, uh, limitations again uh, on the operating pressure, uh, depending on the quality of steel that you use uh, to do your own construction. Again, the point is uh, hydrogen tends to diffuse uh, into the metallic matrix and uh, modify the mechanical properties uh, of the metal where the metal gets saturated with hydrogen. This causes a, a specific kind, a special kind of corrosion. Uh, but uh, this diffusion happens uh, only if uh, a certain threshold of uh, temperature uh, is, uh, is passed. So we are talking of uh, 90 MPa, meaning 900 bars, uh, for having at ambient temperature and uh, 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 high temperature above uh, uh, 200 degrees. So the combination of these two factors high pressure, very high pressure, and the temperature results uh, in diffusivity of hydrogen into the metallic matrix and uh, uh, this kind of corrosion attack. Considering the specific situation of our module, we have uh, 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 divided the module in the different streams. And uh, in, on the little table on the right, you see the pressure, the temperature of the metal, the temperature of the gas. By this picture only, you see that uh, in the normal operation of a normally designed HYL module, there is no area in uh, the module where the pressure exceeds uh, the pressure of uh, uh, the critical pressures, nor uh, in uh, the um, uh, nor in all the tubes. So, all of our normal construction. So the only part where some extra care is needed uh, actually is the process gas heater, inside the process gas heater. Because in all tubes, ducting, uh, even the reactor itself, uh, you never reach uh, these uh, uh, high temperature and high pressure conditions. Because uh, even though the metal, the reaction inside the reactor reaches a thousand degrees, uh, the reactor is a refractory line and the surface of the reactor, meaning that the metal itself never reaches 200 degrees. You can always touch the reactor with a glove, uh, but it never reaches 200 degrees. So most of the construction uh, uh, didn't need any modification when we uh, began designing modules expressly uh, uh, conceived for working with 100% hydrogen because we were already there. You see in those graphs, uh, each of those graphs uh, refer to one of the stream. Stream one, for instance, uh, is the stream of gas uh, of the tail gas. Uh, you see temperature of the gas 450 degrees, pressure 0.37 MPa. 
the red line, the red box you see on the bottom of the graph refers to the condition of the flow, temperature and pressure. You see that there is a temperature on the vertical axis and the partial pressure on the horizontal axis. You begin to have problems of corrosion if this dotted dashed line goes above the line relevant to the material that you chose to uh, that you chose to may begin to have problems of coherent construction this the lowest possible performance is the normal carbon steel that incidentally is what we use and we can use to do even hydrogen this refers to stream one you see that the line is well below the curve of the carbon steel stream two is the stream outside of the recuperator is even colder with a slightly higher uh, temperature, but not much. Stream three is uh, the feeding line. So no temperature at all. You see that the line is very low and so on and so forth. You see that in all the areas, stream five, stream six, all, in all the critical areas uh, where hydrogen uh, is uh, in touch with metallic parts, namely tubes and vessels, uh, in the HOL process, you never reach the critical condition. And uh, even if it would, uh, the only need would be to replace uh, the, uh, the normal carbon steel with some other material, costlier. Austenitic stainless uh, are uh, uh, the first choice when needing to improve this. But thanks to the scheme and thanks to the pressures and temperatures inside the module, we simply don't need. And the HYL module are designed in a way that uh, all the areas that contain process gas, so hydrogen in the language of today's presentation, are isolated by mechanical sealing. So we don't use dynamic sealing trying to blow back uh, the process gas into the module. We actually use valves to isolate uh, the feeding area from the process area. You see there are uh, vessels where the pressure is isolated. We charge uh, the raw material into the vessel. We isolate each vessel and then feed uh, uh, into the module by rotating the four vessel. And at the discharge is just the same. There is a rotary valve feeding out uh, into the buffers, the processed pellets at high temperature. At high temperature, when the vessel is full, we isolate the vessel, we evacuate the processed gas, and then we discharge uh, the DRI pellets. So by design in our module, and this is not anything that we developed specifically for usage of hydrogen, all the modules we did in the past 15 years are done exactly this way, even though they were not conceived for hydrogen. And of course, uh, there is a, a procedural way because uh, uh, independently, we are dealing with uh, uh, an hazardous gas, flammable, it can detonate, uh, uh, it can cause a choking hazard if the atmosphere is saturated with hydrogen. So Tenova is very well aware of this kind of risk uh, and uh, the safety of the equipment uh, constitutes part of uh, the uh, engagement uh, of the general management. And uh, it's, uh, it is uh, uh, transferred to everybody involved in the design and construction of our products in general. Uh, in Europe, the producer of any technological machine is directly responsible for any damage that can occur to the user uh, due to a mistake in design, including every mistake, uh, every uh, uh, mistake uh, caused directly by the operator, but induced by the design of the machine. So by law and by habit, we take this consideration very seriously when designing uh, the, the operation of our, all of our equipment. Uh, we routinely perform the HAZO analysis, meaning that our engineers, when developing or when reconsidering a process scheme, are compelled 
by our procedure to perform this kind of analysis. Taking an example, every single parameter of uh, uh, the operation of some specific piece of equipment, let's say uh, the flow of the cooling water, and then uh, uh, analyzing what happens is if uh, there is no flow, what happens, what, what are the hazards is the, if there is too much flow, uh, what happens if there is not enough flow, what happens, blah, 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 blah. And uh, this for all the parameters uh, affecting the operation of any technology. And uh, we also have uh, a system for managing the risk where we start from uh, the most uh, robust uh, process design. We wear an uh, outer layer uh, uh, to manage the deviation from process that cannot be eliminated by process design by a process basic control system. Then if anything, uh, wrong happens because we, we, we cannot manage to eliminate all the risks by design. The vessel is still a vessel that needs to be in pressure and there are flammable gases inside the vessel. So uh, we uh, design a system of alarms. Uh, uh, we design a, a, a system, an extensive system of instrumentation for safety, detecting, the, detecting every fault before anything serious happens. If the system fails, we have a relief system, like a pressure relief system. If the, if the pressure builds up in the module due to something that the first layers haven't been able to eliminate, then we have a pressure relief system. Then if the pressure release, uh, re, uh, releases gases, we have contention system to avoid that the gases leaks out. Then of course, if even this system fails, uh, uh, there is the need of an emergency plant, uh, an emergency plan in the plant. And of course, an emergency plan of the community in the case uh, of everything else, in the unlikely case uh, that everything else uh, has failed. This is not uh, an engineering uh, guideline. This is only a way of thinking when you design uh, any kind of technological equipment. Through this, uh, let me talk to you about uh, references because uh, uh, actually we feel that the hydrogen reduction is not that much far away. The table here indicates uh, the uh, uh, flow of uh, hydrogen, sorry, that one would use to produce a certain quantity of the RI per year. So for producing two and a half million tons per year of the RI entirely based on hydrogen, so green DRI, one would need 23,000 uh, kilos per hour of hydrogen corresponding of 1.2 gigawatt of electrolyzer, considering the current technologies. Now, we know that the largest electrolyzer operating today is 30 megs. Uh, it just means that uh, the, uh, the quantity of uh, the, uh, the quantity of hydrogen needed to feed the largest existing module in operation, two and a half million ton per year, would need 40 hydrolyzer uh, using the current uh, existing technology. That is not too far away from actually being uh, feasible. And also, the quantity of uh, green energy production is uh, uh, ramping up uh, very quickly. Uh, in Italy, in our country, we are not very well known in the world for being uh, uh, a, very, a very quick country in uh, uh, operating industrial uh, changes. But uh, in our country, in the just few first months of uh, uh, this year, in the first five months, the power grid, the Italian power grid connected more than five gigawatt of renewable power in the first months of the 2022. So this kind of revolution is happening already. The first module ever to operate with 100% hydrogen is hybrid, is uh, in Sweden, has been, uh, please, it's, SSAB, 
in Sweden. It has been uh, uh, built by a joint venture between uh, the steelmakers SAB, the mining company KB, and the local power supplier Vattenfall, with uh, a significant contribution by the Swedish government. This plant uh, operates uh, uh, now with uh, can operate now with 100% hydrogen. Presently, they are running campaign with variable percentages of hydrogen and natural gas to identify the best industrial, uh, the, well, to identify the percentage of carbon in the pellets that results in the better LCA of the whole process. Because a pellet having 0% carbon is a pellet that is hard to melt. So uh, considering the general balance, the general picture, maybe or well, currently, this is not the best possible configuration to minimize CO2. The module started up before the hydrolyzers were uh, up and running. So in the first months of its operation, operated with 100% natural gas. Uh, then they ran campaign with 100% hydrogen, and now they are using different mixes. Uh, again, uh, the module we supplied to hybrid, the, all the main components of the modules. And this module, same as uh, the normal HYL and Argyrum module, has the capability to operate without any changes and modification uh, with any mixes from 100% natural gas or similar to 100% hydrogen. Other uh, uh, steelmakers in Europe are considering our technology. We already have a partnership with the German steelmaker uh, Salzgitter. The first step, uh, now they operate blast furnaces and converter. The first step uh, of operation is uh, set to begin uh, this year with the first uh, uh, contract for the first DRI module. And uh, the plan uh, leads to a complete decarbonization of the hybrid of, of the Salzgitter uh, uh, plant uh, before 2050. There are also a preeminent example of one module uh, sold to the Chinese company HBIS this year. It's a medium sized module producing half a million tons of uh, high quality DRI, operating with 70% hydrogen in the feed. Uh, so, this module we have a record low uh, CO2 emission and it's scheduled to start up production this year, but also Bao Steel ordered a module to Energiarium Consortium for uh, 1 million ton of uh, DRI. Again, based on Energiarium technology, it will be able to operate with mm, natural gas, cocoa and gas, hydrogen, or whatever mixes thereof since uh, the energy is natively able to do so. The technology is natively able to do so. Thank you very much uh, for uh, attending this presentation. Uh, I'm uh, at your full disposal. Thank you, Paolo, for, for, for the, your presentation. I think it was very compelling, very, very uh, good explanation of, of all the technical aspects. Thank you.